Hey everybody, just a quick trigger warning before we get started here. There is some mention of assault as well as racism and gross things like that. So I just want to let you know before we get started here. Award show season is over, right? Like I feel like it must be over now, right? Awards for the arts is kind of a weird thing to me. It's like, hey, here's a statue for making me cry the best out of all the things that made me cry. I mean, I get it. Don't don't get me wrong. I'm an artist, too. We're sensitive souls. So they make us feel good by giving us little prizes. And, and it's nice. And the winner, believe it or not. Whoa, we did it. We won. What? What? what, what? Uh, <laughs> But the Oscars in particular are famous for making sure it's white people that get those little prizes. This year, though, at the Oscars, a movie with a cast that was mostly not white people won a lot of the Oscars, which was pretty cool. But when it comes to race and the Oscars, there is a very specific type of movie they love giving awards to. It's movies about racism, but made by white people. And the Oscar goes to Crash. The Oscar goes to Dances with Wolves. Jim Wilson and Kevin Costner. Driving Miss Daisy, Richard Dizanik, Willie Tanisha. Green Book. As if people of color have never made a movie about racism. You see, this is all part of a bigger problem. The problem of white saviorism. You see, when you live in a world where white people have done a lot of damage for a long time, it can be tempting as a white person to tell yourself that, hey, that wasn't me, and if I was there, I would be the white person who stood up against these injustices. So we make movies about what we would have done if we were there. If I was in the Civil War, I would have fought for the rights of black soldiers while doing a weird accent. You really think you can keep 700 Union soldiers without proper shoes because you think it's funny? Now where would that power come from? If I lived in the 60s, I would have fought against segregation. Like this person, they made up for hidden figures. There we have it. No more colored restrooms. No more white restrooms. Just plain old toilets. I wouldn't be the white person being mean to the help. I'd be the one telling their story. I want to interview you about what it's like to work as a maid. I'd like to do a book of interviews about working for white families. As if black people haven't been telling us their stories for a long time. Would you say that your work in La La Land really helped pave the way for white people to explain jazz to black people. <laughs> <laughs> Has the American educational system let minorities down? Well, the solution isn't to make huge changes to the system, it's to send in super caring white people. So you better make up your mind. Because until you have the balls to look me straight in the eye and tell me this is all you deserve, I am not letting you fail. But there are a lot of people who live in your neighborhood who choose not to get on that bus. What do they choose to do? They choose to go out and sell drugs. They choose to go out and kill people. They choose to do a lot of other things, but they choose not to get on that bus. The people who choose to get on that bus, which are you, are the people who are saying, I will not carry myself down to die. When I go to my grave, my head will be high. That is a choice. See, these movies act like they see the problem, but the solution isn't to do something about the problem, but to do something to make them feel better about their role in the problem. And that's why they're dangerous. But the thing is, white saviorism isn't just in movies. There are real life consequences as well. Hey everybody, thank you so much for liking and subscribing and commenting and all the wonderful stuff you do because you're wonderful people. And uh, I put the links below for the social media as well as the Patreon so you can join us there, join the party, lots of fun. And there's merch. We should get some new stuff soon. 
I'm saying that to myself. It's more of a note to self. We're going to get some new stuff soon. We're going to put some new stuff in the merch. And if, if you don't see any there soon, just tell me, Trevor, where the, where the F word is that merch. So We have done a podcast episode of this before, but I wanted to key in on a few aspects we kind of talked about briefly and go a little bit more in depth. So that's why if you're like, didn't they already cover this? Yes, but in a different format. So just so you know. Also, usually if I use a clip from a YouTuber, I will put their name on the screen. I've decided not to do that with every video this time. A lot of times these are just smaller YouTubers and I don't want people to go over there and shame them. A lot of times they are just caught up in this world and we're sold a bill of goods. If you do a Google search for mission strips, you will realize very quickly that there are many different organizations out there to choose from. And when you watch their promotional material, you will notice a few very consistent things. During my last summer of college, I went on an adventure around the world, and so can you. Every year, thousands of college students go on short-term mission trips. Some go to build a school, a church, some go to just travel the world. But for me, I wanted to experience what real daily missionary life was like. The World Race is for people that are ready to leave their comfort zone, to love the way Jesus loves, and to live radically for the sake of the gospel. There's more out there than your hometown and where you grew up. God will use you to change the world. I just graduated high school last year. I was gonna follow everyone else and go to college, but then I started filling out applications and I was like, this just doesn't feel right. Just because I look back on the person that I was, go to all the parties, and my last thought was the classes I wanted to take. I know now that had I gone to college, I probably wouldn't be in the best situation. <laughs> But it's been so much better and I've gotten to meet people and do things that I never would have. I have a better head on my shoulders and I'm prepared to go to school next year and advance the kingdom there. A wise man once told us, the mission does not start once you get here and it doesn't end once you leave. A mission trip is more than that. Our mission is this, that from the mountains and hills of Guatemala to the valleys and coastlines, we have seen all colors, creeds, cultures, men, women, boys and girls restored to their rightful positions as sons and daughters, families truly restored. First, you will be told how meaningful this trip will be for you. Then you'll be told that you can make a difference in the world all while showing you images of poor people in impoverished areas and a bunch of children running around so happy to see these nice missionary people. Okay, and what's wrong with this? What is wrong with giving up time out of your busy schedule to go out into the world and help people? After all, this is a life-changing experience that helps you grow empathy. We like empathy, right? Who should consider going on short-term missions trips? Well, I said last Sunday in the sermon, everybody, uh, in other words, in America, let's just stick with America, we're wealthy, we're mobile, and uh, we're connected, and it's easy to leave and go somewhere or do something, whether it's going to Purlington in order to help rebuild a church after Katrina, or, or whether it's going to the Dominican Republic or whether it's going to Ireland, or whether it's going to Uganda, or Tanzania. So pretty much anywhere? Like, you could have just said anywhere? We can go. We have the money to go, we have the planes to go, we have the visas to go, and we can, we can go. So the first step to any mission trip is fundraising. I'm not really sure why I signed up, because at that point, I still didn't really believe in missions trips, so to speak. It was probably just because my roommates were going, and I had never been out of the U.S., so maybe it was like a free vacation, only it wasn't free. Anyone who has ever gone on a missions trip knows that a big part of going on that trip is raising money. And since I didn't really wanna go on the trip anyway, you can imagine that I wasn't exactly motivated to fundraise. If you spend any time in a church or around people who go to church, you have gotten that letter from someone who is planning on going on a missions trip and want you to partner with them by giving your financial support. 
First, write a support letter explaining the mission trip and why you want to participate in this type of ministry. This is your opportunity to invite people to be part of the ministry. Next, send it out to your community, your parents' community, your church, your friends, your family, and anyone else you think would be interested in joining your support team. The tedious part about all this is gathering the names and addresses of everyone you're sending a letter to. Ideally, you want to meet with each person after you send them a support letter. And I gotta say, last year when I went, at first I was like, I can't ask people for this. Like, they're gonna think I'm so annoying, they're not gonna give. But I just decided to risk it. And I decided, decided to step out of my comfort zone and to text people, call people, email, write letters, get lunches with people, and explain to them, hey, I wanna go on this trip and we're doing this story there and I just, I need help getting there. I can't do it on my own. Will you be a part of this story and this journey? That's, that's, that's very generous. Oh that my gosh, well, listen, Oscar, generosity and togetherness and community all convalescences into morale is what I say, so. You can also post a shorter version of this letter on your social media. Sharing your story will prove crucial in the fundraising process. And if you're going on the World Race or one of our other programs, you will be given a blog and access to a fundraising course too. You can do what you want with your money. I'm not the money police. But if you ask me for money because you want to help people on the other side of the world, I may start asking questions about how that money is going to be used which is something I did when I was added to a family Facebook chat where my cousin was asking for money for a trip. I never did get an answer about what they were going to actually do on the trip, but I was told by a family member that I was being kind of rude for asking. Lots of sacrifices that come into going on a missions trip. You're giving up time at work, you're giving up time with friends and family back home. You're sacrificing a ton of time and effort and energy. And then the most terrifying, scary sacrifice of all is the money. Now this is my second year going to Malawi and Malawi will cost $3,900 for me. And then I might hopefully be going to Lebanon with Mosaic Global later on in the summer. And that's gonna cost an extra 2,500. A lot of money. And I'll be honest, I don't know what training she has that qualifies her over others to travel around the world helping people. But part of me wonders if that money can go further if it's spent a little differently. But again, I'm not sure what her special skills are that qualify her to do these things that can't be done by, you know, local people. But if God wants her to go, if God wants these people to go on these missions, he's going to make it happen. And I won that most improved award. I guess I sucked the most at the beginning and then got a little better. But when I won this award, I was given my certificate and I was also handed an envelope. And when I opened this envelope after the ceremony, there was a check inside. And I am telling you, I could not make this next part up. The exact amount of that check to the dollar was the same amount of money I needed for the trip. And I'm sitting there looking at this check and I'm like, okay, God, be a little more subtle next time. And so I used that check from that award to fund my first missions trip to Nicaragua. But at the end of the day, I have trusted God with my money over and over again. And every single time he's had my back, he's had a person help me out or he's given me a new hosting job that raised me a lot of money, earned me a lot of money within just three days, or he's given me new opportunities to raise money or babysitting, you name it. He always comes through. And people are always like, how on earth do you afford to live in LA and do everything? And I'm like, I, I don't like have a concrete answer for that because I'm not making enough from my job and I'm spending a lot. But the only explanation when it comes down to it is God, God's got my back. So when it comes to you wanting to do a missions trip like this, me wanting to do these, I don't worry because I know that I'm going over there and I'm doing something for Jesus and I'm loving his people, which he's called me to do. And I'm expanding his mission and being a part of something bigger than myself. And God's going to honor that. He's going to, He's going to come through. Okay, so God is going to supply you with money so that you can go to a place that doesn't have any money so that you can help them out instead of God just providing those people with money and resources so that they don't need your help. 
And speaking of money, how about the 20 bucks you owe me? Oh, yeah. Well, I only got 10, so here's 10 and I owe you 10. Thanks. Hey, Mo, you owe me 20. Well, here's 10 and I'll owe you 10. Uh-uh. You owe me 20. Here's 10, I owe you 10. Here's the 10 I owe you. Here's the 10 I owe you. Here's the 10 I owe you. Good. Now we're all even. Could God maybe just, you know, skip the middleman? Just give them the money? Or does he not trust them with money? What I find interesting, too, is that whenever something you want to happen happens, it's God's confirmation that it's his will that you do this thing, whatever it is. But if something bad happens, it's the devil trying to stop you because he knows that it's God's will for you to do this thing. So whatever happens, it's God's will? So the first thing that really stood out to me when I was on the missions trip that I was not expecting was that the devil is going to do everything in his power to stop the Lord's work from happening. I'm just going to give you a couple examples of things that happened on the missions trip that were like threats from the devil, I guess you could say. I I knew that it was the devil's mission to stop me from giving my testimony to the people. I went out there and I said my testimony from my heart and I think that that was ultimately God's plan because it really flowed nicely and I just had a lot to say to the teens and I felt like I was really giving from my heart. So the devil tried to stop you from giving your testimony, but then you did give your testimony and it went well? Crafty devil. Next few things were also a, the devil trying to distract me. There was a really cute boy that I liked on the missions trip, and it would have been so easy for me to consume all my thoughts on him instead of the Lord, but um, luckily the Holy Spirit was telling me to focus on the missions trip and not on love relationships. So... I avoided that one. It was hard. So wait, did the devil make it so he was attractive? Or did the devil convince the attractive person to go on a missions trip? Is the devil recruiting people to mission trips based on their looks to distract other missionaries from doing their job? Or wait, did the devil give you a sex drive? Gone, 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 she been gone so long, she been gone, gone, gone so long. Did the devil determine who you're attracted to? What what exactly was the devil's role in this? The next thing was there was a huge storm. I mean like there was lightning surrounding us. And we were outside and my friend was giving her testimony. And this storm could have been the most distracting thing for these kids and that was the devil trying to get the kids not to listen to what we had to say and all of the leaders were looking around at these kids and we were in our heads we were praying for them that god would focus their minds on the message and not on the storm okay so let me get this straight you went to a tropical location, I'm assuming, and then thought that the weather that happened in this area that you're not used to was somehow about you? This is someone who really believes they are the main character. Also, they are the people from that area, right? Like the people who were distracted. So maybe they know the weather a little bit more than you do and know when to pay attention to a storm because maybe storms are known to cause a lot of damage, especially in underdeveloped areas where mission trips might occur at. But again, that's the way it goes. If everything works out, God did it. And if there's any problem, it's the devil trying to stop you. How can you possibly determine the difference? Maybe it's because you already know what you want to do and you are going to do it no matter what. Like this guy who wanted to convert Muslims to Christianity in a very Islamic country. Missions isn't so glorious. The call to missions among unreached peoples is often exciting, but the reality is 
often quite different. We've now been working among Arab Muslims for the past 17 years, and it has not gone as I had hoped. I never expected that after 17 years of working with Arab Muslims, I would have personally been involved in seeing one person come to faith. I never expected it would be such a struggle for my wife to live overseas. I never expected that I would get so discouraged at times that I was wondering, am I depressed? I never expected we'd lose our firstborn son living overseas. But I've had very few victories in my time overseas, and that's okay. Because even though missions isn't very glorious, Jesus is. Okay, first, how can you think God called you to do something and then have all these things fail so miserably and still think it was God who called you to do that? And how did they possibly think it could go any different? I mean, besides Jesus said so, you are going to have to go to an Arab country to try to spread Christianity, you know, that religion that they have been in conflict with for hundreds of years? What do they think would happen if a Muslim missionary came to a small Bible Belt town in America to convert Christians? Would they expect a different result? Okay, so let me tell, ask you, sir. You don't like this construction. Tell me about your dream mosque. There is no, no dream mosque. mosque. We don't want a mosque. We don't want a mosque. Mosque, as soon as you said mosque, you ruined it. And the last thing that the devil tried to do to get me down was that I had a fever for three days on my missions trip and I was so sick. That was the devil trying to bring me down, trying to make me feel like this missions trip was a mistake. I should have just stayed home if I was going to be sick. But no, I still accomplished God's work even though I was sick. I stayed faithful and I relied on God through all of those things that the devil tried to get me down with. Why do I always find myself agreeing with the devil? Yes, if you're sick, don't go to a foreign country. I know she made this video before the giant pandemic of 2020, but we've learned our lesson by now, right? Like, like we know not to spread illnesses to other countries. No? No, we haven't? We haven't learned that lesson yet? Yeah, that makes sense. Which is why in Brazil, there are indigenous people who have to stay on guard to protect tribes from missionaries, even since 2020. This is the outpost of the National Indigenous Foundation, the government agency in charge of protecting the isolated tribes of the Javari Valley. But it was unable to stop missionaries from entering their lands and trying to make contact with them. One American missionary is said to have been found by the Matisse people down this river, the Taquai River. This has been going on for so long, and it's been killing people for so long, which is why it's really hard to have any sympathy for John Allen Chow, a person that many Christians still see as a martyr. John Allen Chow wanted to bring Christianity to the people of North Sentinel Island in the Bay of Bengal. Fishermen reported they watched as tribe members shot him with arrows. Now advocates for the tribe are insisting that his body be left alone. Many tribes around that area have been wiped out by disease and invaders. So of course they are taking a strong stance. They are protecting their people. Survival International advocates for the rights of tribes across the globe, especially tribes that resist contact with strangers. They say isolated tribes don't have the immunity from diseases that outsiders like Chow could be carrying. And any attempt to remove his body could be fatal for the North Sentinelese people. It's really not uncommon for an uncontacted tribe when they first have contact with people from outside to be completely decimated um, by disease. Many communities, 90% were wiped out and some, the whole community disappeared. But it's okay. Missionary organizations think the risks were minimal. I mean, sure, maybe they'll get sick, but at least they'll have Jesus. All Nations leader Mary Ho says that Chow joined the organization last year and was well prepared. She said All Nations considered any health risk he posed to be minimal. Chow received 13 immunizations before heading out and he quarantined himself for days.
no one knows the exact uh, health condition of the people. And in past history, yes, uh, contact with uh, Western population has wiped out local populations. But we are actually in a different time of advanced medicine and antibiotics. And I think a lot of modern medicine uh, may be able to help the local population in some of the health issues. We just don't know. But we're talking about short-term missions here, a life-changing experience for the people who go and the people they help. Okay, well, let's start with that first part. It's a life-changing experience for people who go on the trip. The way that these trips can be life-changing and meaningful for the team members is some of the very same ways that it can be life-changing and meaningful for those receiving the teams. When both those coming on a mission trip and those receiving a mission team are able to work together and serve alongside of each other in a community, there's life change and there's transformation on both sides. And in that sense, even though they're coming from these radically different backgrounds, they're actually participating in the same kind of life-changing experience. I never actually went on a mission trip at my time at churches. I did a couple volunteer things like handing out food to homeless people, things like that. Something I still do, but without the you have to convert to Jesus part. But I did go to a couple planning meetings once when I was thinking about going on a mission trip and then decided not to. And I still think about those meetings often because of that emphasis. It's usually the people who go that benefit more. This was something that was supposed to be a selling point. But at the time, and still now, it put a bad taste in my mouth. For a long time, I just couldn't figure out why it bothered me so much. Helping people should make you feel good. And it's okay to help people and feel good about it. That's not why it bothered me. There was something more to that statement than got me. I think part of it is that it's the selling point. Not only did I learn the cliche truth that these missions trips are more often for the people who are going than they are for the people who are being served, which was absolutely true for me. But I also learned, and I continue to learn, that God is going to get you where he wants you to go, sometimes against your best effort. And at some point, again, hopefully earlier than I did, you're going to have to just put aside your reservations or your fears or your stubbornness or your anxiety. You're going to have to put all that aside and you're just going to have to say, okay, God, I surrender. We are going to another country to experience their culture, to see their struggles, to experience their way of life for a short amount of time so that we can feel better. It feels like we are using people as a prop to give us perspective. It's about the experience. It's about the change in our heart and our mindset. Um, because I think living your mission is less about that one week experience. And it's more about how are we going to live our everyday lives? How are we going to live when we get home? How are we going to impact our own communities? When we can start thinking about mission in that way, that it's not about this one experience, but that that one experience can kind of propel us into action and can kind of change our perspective on the world. All of a sudden, I think that's where it becomes really powerful. And that Jesus changes you way more than you could ever change the people that you come in contact with. You're bringing help to others, but, he's, but God's also using it to help you. Give money towards endeavors, projects, those are all awesome, but then also pray about taking the risk to go. Because when you're there, your heart is transformed in a very human way. Plus, you are God's tangible hands and feet kingdom presence in their lives in that day. And very, very hard of it. It has to do with challenging and trying to engage all of us that have a faith to say, how will we live our life in a way that is about mission? It's about what do you do with the choices that you make each day and what do you do with the things that God entrusts you with and how do you live your life that has meaning and significance and it really is all about love and service. But what's the big deal? Sure, maybe it's more about the experience than it is about helping people, but they are helping people, right? That counts for something. Did, did you see that? They were laying bricks and moving stones and stuff. I will not stand idly by while these Mexican villagers are sick. We're actually building them a school. Whatever. They need to I won't. I, I won't stand for it. There are 417 of us. 
417 out of 7 billion. We've given up our summer to serve God on the mission field. We've come from all over the world to train at the Lord's Boot Camp in Merritt Island, Florida. Two weeks of intense training and the living conditions are rough. We wake up at 5.30 and run an obstacle course, eat, spend time with the Lord, get training in construction, and different methods of sharing Christ. They're training these children to be bricklayers and sending them across the world. There's this famous thing on a DVD commentary of the movie Armageddon where Ben Affleck tells a story about how we approached Michael Bay about how ridiculous the plot to Armageddon was. We've had them training for eight months solid now. Eight whole months? Well, pretty much, yeah. Oh, gee whiz. Well, like eight whole months? As if that's not enough time to learn how to drill a hole. But in a week, we're going to learn how to be astronauts. Oh, one whole week? Now you know how to fly into space? I need my guys. Why do you need them? They're the best. Everyone's the best. Why are they the best? I don't know. They just are. And when I see these clips of these kids learning how to be bricklayers or carpenters or whatever else, I think about that logic here. Is it really easier to train kids to be bricklayers than fly them out or drive them to this country? Or would it be better to just pay the already trained bricklayers who already live in that area to do the work that these kids were going there to do for a much cheaper price than it would cost to send these kids to pretend to be bricklayers. And a lot of times people have to come in anyway and fix all the mistakes that these kids make. But when you just pay local people to do the work that they're trained to do, the money that they're paid is now in that local economy and it will benefit more people in that area. The money would go way further and you would also spend way less money than if you just flew a bunch of church kids out there. But this part goes back to that white savior thing. We know what we're doing. They're just in a third world country. What do they know about this stuff? If we go out there, we'll take care of it for them and we'll feel good about ourselves for doing it. It's like Renee Bach, a woman who thought that being white and American was pretty much the same thing as being a doctor. We got our hands on this copy of the lawsuit. The Women's Pro Bono Initiative and two mothers filed this civil suit in a court in Uganda, saying actions by the group, the nonprofit serving his children, led to the deaths of their children. The allegations stirring up a firestorm of criticism and tonight the woman taking the heat is firing back. The organization not just for losing hope but losing lives. Two mothers and the women's pro bono initiative suing Bach and serving his children. Court documents say they were led to believe Bach was a medical doctor claiming she unlawfully practiced medicine and offered medical services to unsuspecting vulnerable children. In these now-deleted images, she's seen wearing a stethoscope administering care to children. The plaintiffs say they only learned after their children died Bach had no proper medical training. Um, what stands out on this story is the fact that um, someone with no medical qualification would come to a country like Uganda and treat our children and then relate it to being a call from God. This is so dangerous and it is happening in, in, in the in the missionary world as well. It is it is all about God. It is God who sends people to Africa. There are a lot of people who grew up with privilege who have this mindset that they earned where they are in their life. And then the logical assumption after that is that the people who aren't in that position deserve to be where they are too. And they believe that just by being them in their situation, that gives them the qualifications to help these people. Even if it's in a skill set that they know nothing about. But these service projects, the construction, the serving people, isn't really the point of the trip, is it? It's to spread the word of the Lord. There are 25 different teams with one goal. One goal. One goal in one mission. To proclaim Jesus Christ to all nations. How we do short-term mission trips is really important because people really matter to God. So it's more important that we take the time to care about people, to get to know their name, to look in their eyes, to hear their story, to know who they are, to care about their dignity, than it is for us to do something for them. Because in the end, when we leave, what really matters is how we were a picture of God's love to all those that we connected with. 
doesn't really matter if we have terrible workmanship as long as we make more Christians because we don't have enough Christians, apparently. A lot more about the people and the relationships than it is about the agenda or the outcomes or the, the end goals. So not only do they come in and take away possible employment from local people at higher cost, they don't really care about the quality of what they do because it's actually about the relationships. We really strive to um, put everyone in a place where they have the ability to form real relationships, where they have the ability to hear someone's story and share their own story and um, allow God to use them through that. And that's unique and that's, that's changing people, whether it's a participant or the people in the community. It sounds tame, right? We just want to share our stories. We just want them to know what Christ has done in our lives. But what does that actually do? They frame it as they're just telling their stories, but they ignore the fact that missionaries have been destroying cultures for centuries. How some in our society today view missionaries has changed a great deal from 100 years ago when the American press wrote glowing newspaper accounts of David Livingstone's exploits in deepest, darkest Africa. Today, the media and many anthropologists view missionaries with suspicion as troublesome meddlers into primitive cultures. CBN News reporter Galen Tetro has looked into the charges and has this report. And it's not just about the saving grace of Jesus. It's about telling people that the things that they have been doing for millennia are actually evil practices that have to be stopped immediately. All cultures have unique and beautiful elements. All also need to be redeemed. But in the process of bringing the gospel to all cultures, tribes, and peoples, do missionaries do more harm than good? Cultures are fallen. They need the healing power of Christ to fulfill their God-given purpose. But today, many anthropologists contend that the unreached peoples of the world would be better left alone. In many cases, it's cultural genocide disguised as just telling our stories. This is Hollywood's portrayal of the Christian missionary. Rotten, hateful, a killjoy that preys on tribes and peoples. This is a matter of fact that interests me a great deal. So why do you want to change them? If the Lord made Indians the way they are, who are you people to make them different? But missionaries believe that for all cultures, including our own, the only hope of any people is Jesus Christ and freedom from the bondage of sin. The gospel brings hope. It brings deliverance from all that. Missions professor Dr. Howard Foltz. And it raises people to their personhood in Christ and makes them what God created them to be in the first place. What is more positive than that? Yeah, I think, I think bad missionaries uh, ruin culture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and yet, I, I think that... Um, it's not like we're getting it right. It's not like we're sort of uh, learning how to do it perfectly. And, and the way we know now, we're so enlightened and they used to do it really terribly. Um, I think it's always an adventure. I mean, that's, yeah. that's the idea. And so yeah. to, blame, to blame the generations that have gone ahead for making terrible mistakes, for, for, for pairing their faith with their, with their government, you know, as, 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 that, those are messy things that we would not do anymore. But we learned not to do them because people did that. Uh, so, so to me, I, I'm tr I try not to be too judgmental about uh, mistakes made in the past, and yet we do need to learn from them. Everyone makes mistakes. That's why they put erasers on pencils. Duh. <laughs> we've made a few mistakes. We learn from the way we've destroyed societies. Who am I to judge? Some people are so geeky. How geeky are they? <laughs> hey, they write articles where even the headline is a schnooze. Here's a headline of an article I read recently by Andrea Dilly. The surprising discovery about those colonialist proselytizing missionaries. Oh, I'm sorry. I was, <laughs> huh? The surprising discovery about those colonialist proselytizing missionary. Translation, hey, those missionaries who go overseas and impose their values on people, we should just leave those cannibals alone and let them just keep eating each other. It's that wicked to impose our values on people. It's almost like Todd Friel is a very bad person who no one should listen to. But also, we kind of should pay attention to him because he says the quiet part out loud. These missionaries think that they have the answer and everyone else are just dirty savages who need Jesus. 
In Canada and in a lot of countries, we see the way that missions have harmed our First Nations in a way that they are still feeling the hurt from. Ripped from their families and put in residential schools, Indigenous children were forbidden to speak their own languages and practice their traditions. Many were sexually and physically abused. Sheila North's mother was one of the 150,000 children who passed through Canada's residential schools. The forced assimilation deeply scarred North's family. It strips away people's dignity. It strips away people's self-worth. And then when they pass on and become children or parents, they treat people the way they've been treated unconsciously. But you know, whatever. Everyone makes an oopsie. Yeah, I think I think bad missionaries uh, ruin culture. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> Just look at what so many countries that have been the targets of evangelical missionaries have been doing to their LGBTQIA communities. Uganda is the number one destination for American missionaries. They are flocking. And when you go on the, get on the plane to go to Uganda, it's filled with missionaries. Everyone's praying in groups at the airport. The controversial bill proposed death sentence for homosexuality. The law says no homosexuality in this nation. It's an abomination to God. We can't pretend that they're just spreading love. This kind of thing has real world consequences. Maybe your missionary spent so much time asking if you could reach the entire world for Christ without asking, should you reach the entire world for Christ? We spent so much time asking if we could cure Jokic, we never asked if we should cure Jokic. But Trevor, what about the poverty? What about the orphans? Um, definitely the same struggles as the other side of the island with, in regard to just the depravity. Um, and that same like instant connection that you can have with people, um, like uh, Fedley, a little boy, just you know, run up and just instantly like feeling comfortable playing with my arm hair. <laughs> like, <laughs> After all, children are one of the biggest draws for missionaries. I know because I was the one that blurred all their faces in this video, and that was really time consuming. If you look up mission strips on Instagram, you get a bunch of photos of people posing happily with children who are in no way related to them besides the fact that they saw them for a couple days on a mission strip. But yeah, sure, that might be tacky, but what could possibly be wrong with helping orphans? Do you hate orphans, Trevor? Your nights of sleeping on floors, enduring mosquitoes, and taking on the heat you brought love to the orphans, comfort to the sick, and good news to the poor. We also had opportunities to love on the children. From bounce house outreaches for the community to serving ice cream to over 300 kids at an orphanage and loving on disabled children. If there are any Christians that are still watching this, even if you don't like me, even if you can't stand me, even if you've disagreed with everything I have ever said, and you think I'm a bad person who is going to hell and is sending people to hell, Please, can I ask you one favor? Just one thing. Please, 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 please never use the phrase love on again. Ever, ever, ever again. Thank you so much. It is the most cringy thing I have ever heard in my life. And I was an evangelical Christian for 30 plus years. I'm done. Do what you want. Pull the plug. Stop and think for a minute, especially if you live in a westernized country. When was the last time you saw an orphanage in your city? Think about the movie Annie. Annie's an orphan, right? She lives in an orphanage. Except for in the 2014 remake where she lives in foster care. You just don't see that institutionalized approach anymore. We've realized that the better thing to do is to offer resources and assistance to families so that they don't feel like they have to give up their children. And in situations where the kids can't stay with their families, they are placed in foster care. 
Yes, it's a system that still needs a lot of work, but we know at least it's a better option than an orphanage. But when it comes to other countries, we are more than okay with dumping so much money into these institutions. We don't want it for our kids, but we're okay with it for their kids. It's estimated that over 80% of children in these orphanages have parents who are alive. Many of those parents who visit regularly simply see this as the best option for their children as they do not have the means to support them. And if there were means to support them, they would. But many local governments don't see a need to put these programs into place because these missionary groups already come in and start these orphanages. Remember what that guy said about the kid who was instantly drawn to him? Instant connection that you can have with people. Um, like uh, Fedley, a little boy just, you know, run up and just instantly like feel uncomfortable playing with my arm hair. <laughs> That's less cute than you think, and more of a sign of an attachment disorder. Not only did the parents see the orphanage as the only option, which would cause abandonment issues for sure, now they have a rotating door of people coming in, giving them attention, giving them gifts, taking photos with them, and then leaving for good till the next group comes in. Listen to this person who actually does support mission trips but doesn't support this type of mission, talk about it. As, as you see the children run up to you and they're excited and they hug you and they're friendly, they want to sit on your lap. And you can often look at this and go, wow, these kids are so happy. Yeah. This is and evidence of this being me. great. And I am the savior to exactly. them all. And what we don't stop and think about it from a, a child development perspective or even reflect for those of us of us that are parents on our own children's behavior. Yeah. If my child was to meet a complete stranger, is that how my child would react? No, no. They're gonna hide behind my leg. Correct. They're gonna peep out and they're gonna have a look, and then they're gonna watch me, watch how I interact with this person. Wow. And after a little while, they're gonna go. I think my mum's giving me a signal that this person's okay. So I, now I might go sit next to them and draw with them or do something. And over time, longer time, that affection might might come out. Wow. But it's never immediate. That's unnatural. That is evidence of reactive attachment disorders that is not normal child behavior wow. and but it's hard for volunteers to interpret yeah, that yeah yeah when uh, when you I it's harming these kids but you get your cute instagram photo that makes you look like a good person and then there is also the other possibility you take a bunch of children and you put them together away from their parents with not enough supervision and then you invite people from all around the world to just come in and have access to them? What are you expecting to happen? FBI agents and police arrested 60-year-old Gregory Dow at his home in rural Lancaster County. They've charged him with abusing four teenagers at an orphanage he ran in Kenya, then fleeing arrest in that country. A federal judge acquitted an Oklahoma man on three charges accusing him of sexually abusing children at a Kenyan orphanage, but they denied him a new trial on four other counts. A jury found Matthew Durham guilty in June on seven counts of engaging in illicit sexual conduct in foreign places. Today, U.S. District Judge David Russell acquitted the 21-year-old on three of those counts, ruling that government prosecutors hadn't proved he engaged in sexual acts with the three alleged victims. No sentencing date has been set on the four convictions. Well, according to federal investigators, Meredith, this all took place in Brazil. And uh, this man, a missionary from this church right behind me here in Sanford, the New Tribes Mission, was flying into OIA from Brazil. And that's where federal agents were waiting for him. As soon as he got off the plane, Warren Kennel was found with two hard drives in his luggage on the hard drives, two images. A former pastor from Milledgeville was scheduled to be sentenced today for sexually assaulting a 14-year-old girl. Eric Tuninga pleaded guilty in February and could serve up to 30 years in prison. Federal prosecutors said that assault happened three years ago while Tuninga was doing missionary work in Uganda. It's disgusting and a lot more needs to be done to stop it. Sometime in every Christian's life in America, they should go. Do something, you know, from the time you're 9 to 90, plan a couple of weeks of short-term missions. I can't think of any reason why a Christian wouldn't want to build that into a life plan. And then to say, maybe God will do something with it that will shape my whole 
life. So I don't, I don't want to pick out a category of Christians and say they should do short-term missions. I think all of us should. We're flying in. Uh, you can just see open space everywhere. The, the population density here is a lot lower. Um, and then stepping off the plane, I kind of got hit with a little bit of, uh, of heat. But something else that struck me was there's a lot of, a lot of poverty that we drove through. And just it's a different way of life. And so I think I'm really looking forward to being able to minister to the people there, but also the perspective is really valuable. And I don't think there's a lot of places uh, in America that I can really go to get that same experience. I think this is an invaluable opportunity to go and experience the way that the Lord works in a different country, in a different people with a different situation and something that I don't think I could ever get uh, through a book or through, you know, um, without actually living it. Yeah. That perspective is valuable, which is why missions organizations are a big business. It's a business that relies on showing images of poor communities and taking their missions groups to poor communities, which many say contributes to the reason that these communities stay in the conditions that they are in. You can't convince people to give money to a community that is already doing well. You can't sell the poor people experience if you're actually helping these people. It's easy to give money. Anyone can give money. Stay here. Take care of that problem. But it's, it's out of your comfort zone to go to that place where it's maybe hot, maybe uh, out of your comfort zone to actually to, to sit and, and be with the children, listen to them, see what's going on. Walking through mud, walking through different places that are, that are really hard to get to. But at the end of the day, it'll be worth it. It'll be worth it when you get to offer something to them, and of course they're going to offer something to you. That will change your life forever. So you keep them poor while the CEOs of these mission organizations make six-figure salaries. And even if they aren't deliberately keeping them poor, ask yourself this. Why are these organizations who have been in these areas sometimes 50 to 60 years, why haven't they changed the economy in these areas for the better? Why are these areas still struggling so much if these trips work so well? Maybe because they work well for the organization and for the people going, but not so well for the people they are exploiting, the people that are supposed to be the ones getting this help. Human beings living their lives are not objects for you to come and see so that you can change your perspective. But at least these people get to see that really radical drama that these youth group kids have been working on, right? Okay, here's the thing. If you want to see other countries and cultures, that is awesome, and you should do that. But do it as a tourist who pays them for things while you're there. Do it as someone who contributes to the local economy, not takes away from the local economy. Sure, it's harder to raise money for a trip like that, but at least you know you're doing something that isn't destroying lives. Humble yourself and realize that sometimes there aren't quick fixes to the world's problems. It'd be nice to just raise some money, do some good, and then feel better about your impact on the world. But maybe it just doesn't work that way. Maybe the world is a little messier than that. At the beginning of this video, I talked about how we like to imagine what we would do if we were alive when these injustices were done. And a lot of the times we like to imagine that we would be the hero of the story. I got some bad news and I've got some good news. The bad news is that injustices are happening all around us. People are trying to take away voting rights from minorities. Police are systematically killing black people. Many places are making it harder and harder and even illegal for trans kids to get the medical care they need. Anti-LGBTQIA laws are on the rise. Segregation is not over. We still have many barriers of entrance for minorities when it comes to education, living situations, and employment. And we still have prison systems that are disproportionately filled with minorities. The good news? You can be the hero that you imagine yourself being. 
There are many ways to stand up against injustices. Join or organize protests, sign petitions, write letters to politicians, be the voice for the voiceless, stand up when you see injustices in your daily life, speak up when you hear people saying negative things about marginalized groups. If you can do it, give money to organizations fighting for rights. Find ways to make a difference. And most importantly, listen. Listen to these people who are being oppressed. Listen to these people in these marginalized groups. You're walking alongside these people, supporting them. You're not coming in to be their savior. There are many ways to make a difference in this world. Sometimes it's 101. Sometimes it's just having a kind word. Sometimes it's just buying someone a meal or dropping off some groceries. There are plenty of ways to make this world a better place. But from what I can tell, going on a missions trip just isn't the way to do it. As fun as it might be. As always, thank you so much for making it this far. If you know somebody who may benefit from this, send it their way. And uh, you have yourself a great week, a month, however long it takes us to see you again. Work, 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 Sky Moon. (laughs) Totally didn't forget to record this outro, and I just happened to be wearing a different shirt, uh, not because it's the next day or anything like that.